I promise next week I won't wear a shirt that's the same color as my wall. Deal with it for now. So we've discussed history and we've discussed character and continuity changes as it applies to DC Comics in the New 52, but this week we're going to touch upon what I think has really come to define the relaunch. Editorial Mandate. The problem with working for a mainstream comic book publisher is while they may give you a lot of creative freedom to write and draw whatever you want, at any given point you could be subjected to interference from the editorial team. This doesn't just apply to DC either. Marvel Comics, Valiant, IDW, basically any company that owns a brand, be it company owned or licensed, the editorial staff has final say on what ultimately gets published. This is similar to the idea of the final cut in movies where whoever has final cut gets the last say on what gets released. Now ideally this would fall into the hands of somebody who actually had a creative stake in the project, like the director of a film or the writer or artist of a comic book. Unfortunately it's either the studio or the publisher that gets final say on what's released, often at the expense of the artist's vision. Bottom line, if you want to keep your artistic freedom, you gotta go independent. You won't make a lot of money, but at least you'll be free. But this isn't a creative rights episode, this is about DC Comics specifically. Since the start of the New 52, it's been very clear that DC has one singular vision it wants all of his titles to follow. This runs the gambit from artwork adhering to their house art style, which we've talked about previously, and also similar writing themes and tropes that are put into all the books. And while this does make sense, I understand why they would want to keep the universe tight and cohesive and unified as possible. This does come at the expense of the artist's or writer's creative freedom, and oftentimes their happiness. It's gotten to the point where it's actually pretty commonplace to hear about conflict between the creative team and the editorial staff at DC Comics. Some creators are so dissatisfied they are leaving, vowing never to work for DC again. Some are actually being fired outright. Now, like the character changes we talked about last week, to talk about all the behind-the-scenes shakeups at DC Comics since the launch of New 52 would just take forever. So I'm just going to touch on some of the major ones that have happened. If you want to know more, the blog Gutters and Panels had an excellent post about all the shakeups in DC Comics during the New 52, from the launch all the way up until September of last year. I'll put a link in the description, it's definitely worth checking out. So right off the bat, in September 2011, at the beginning of the New 52, it was announced that legendary writer-artist George Perez will be leaving Superman after issue 6. This announcement was made shortly after issue 1 came out in the same month. Perez would later state in July of 2012 that this was because of all the changes he was forced to make to his stories, often with little to no explanation as to why he had to do it. He says to have often been given conflicting reasons as to why things had to be altered. Making things worse was that Grant Morrison, who was writing the other Superman book, Action Comics at the time, was not sharing any of his plot details. And because Action Comics was being pushed as the premier Superman book at the time, probably because Grant Morrison was writing it, George Perez would often be forced to change what he was doing in Superman to adhere to what was going on with Action without even really knowing what was going on in Action. So already things are not off to a good start. But things got worse in August of 2012, when Rob Liefeld left the books he was working on over creative dispute. Now, like pretty much everyone who had left DC Comics over creative dispute, Liefeld eventually explained why he left. But unlike everybody else, he did it immediately following his departure. Almost instantly, he stated that editorial conflict was the reason behind him leaving DC Comics, even going so far as to calling out his associate editor at the time, Brian Smith. And as people were jumping to Brian Smith's aid, defending him and his character, Rob Liefeld just basically got into Twitter fights with just about all of them. This includes Batman writer Scott Snyder, who sent Liefeld a simple private message on Twitter, and then Liefeld made their conversation public for the world to see. Now, I'm by no means a Rob Liefeld fan, I'm pretty sure not a lot of people are, but you gotta admire the passion and balls this guy has. He really seemed to have cared about what he was doing, and the fact that he had so many problems forcing him to leave just shows that he's really passionate about comics, even if he can't draw feet. Later, in December of 2012, writer Gail Simone was outright fired from Batgirl. But here's where things start to get a little odd. See, Batgirl was a very successful book, both critically and commercially. Everybody loved it. Superman and the Liefeld books at the time weren't exactly all critical darlings or bestsellers. To fire one of your most well-liked writers over email with little to no explanation just screams conspiracy theory. But this does have a happy ending, because only two weeks after her firing, Gail Simone was reinstated as the writer of Batgirl only to leave earlier this year over creative differences, but this time it was voluntary. Then on March 20th of 2013, both Andy Diggle and Joshua Vialkov left Action Comics and Green Lantern Corps respectively. Andy Diggle quit Action Comics right before his first issue came out. His artist at the time, Tony Daniels, completed the arc, which was only three issues, and then he was moved on to Superman Wonder Woman. Joshua Vialkov left without writing anything, 
Robert Venditti and Van Jessen immediately took over writing Green Lantern Corps the second he announced he was leaving. The rumor at the time was that Fialkov left because DC Comics wanted him to kill off the Green Lantern John Stewart, which as of this recording in 2014 hasn't happened yet. Now this has never been confirmed outright by any party, but the fact that this was at least a rumor just gives you a little bit of an insight to how DC is dictating their stories for certain titles. Now in August of 2013, co-publishers Dan DiDio and Jim Lee finally addressed these editorial conflicts. Kind of. While DiDio essentially tap danced around the issue, only really saying that things are better now than they've ever been in DC Comics for creators, Jim Lee essentially went out of his way to blame the creators who left for not willing to collaborate with everybody. Which doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense because a lot of creators who left DC over editorial conflict went to Marvel and are having little to no problems just writing books. Also, Gail Simone is currently writing Red Sonja for Dynamite and Tomb Raider for Dark Horse, both to critical and commercial success. So, And finally, almost exactly a year ago, J.H. Williams III and W. Hayden Blackman left Batwoman over editorial conflict over whether or not their main character, Kate Kane, can get married. I covered that in the very first episode of The Wolf Den, so click here to see our Embarrassingly humble beginnings. Emphasis on embarrassing. I'm just a snake eating his own tail at this point. Now since then, there haven't really seemed to have been any major editorial conflicts and shakeups at DC Comics. But who really knows how long that'll last. It's definitely interesting to see DC Comics under such a large microscope. Everybody's eyes are on them to see if they'll succeed or fail. At this point, any problem, no matter how small, can be seen as a sign of their business falling apart. Which I guess makes sense, no publisher has ever tried such a massive relaunch like this before. So our eyes are on DC Comics to see how this is going to play out in the future. How is this playing out? Well tune in next week for the conclusion of New 52 Month, where we examine where DC Comics is now, and what their future looks like. So make sure you subscribe to catch part 4. Also leave a comment down below or on Facebook or Twitter with your opinion on all the shakeups and backstage issues that have been plaguing DC Comics since the relaunch. So thank you very much for watching, make sure you like and share this video as well, and I will see you next time. So as mentioned last week, the New 52 completely started everything over again for DC. They had a new timeline and a new history, the universe itself only being about five years old. No, you're going to be fumbling through your wrist to get the song when you can easily slide out your phone and pick the damn song. It'll That's what's going to happen. It'll have series so I can just be like, hey, play this.